Good morning and, uh, and welcome everyone. Um, I particularly want to applaud all of you who've made an effort on a very difficult weather day to be here and be part of this, including our distinguished visitor who's an alum of this school and this university who came all the way from Texas to be here in a great Michigan winter scene. Um, my name is Barry Rabe. I'm a professor here at the Ford School and direct the Center for Local, State, and Urban Policy one of the partners with the Ford School on this initiative, and we're delighted to welcome you to this discussion, this conversation about water system finance. I particularly want to thank our other partners in this activity, our other sponsors, SEAS, the School for Environment and Sustainability, the Environmental Law and Policy Program, the Graham Sustainability Institute, and I particularly want to thank the Ford School for support through our conversations across difference initiative. More on that in a moment. I also want to thank uh, alums of the public management class, performance management, a number of students who are here today, Amelia Eisenstadt and Allie Waters, joined by Tom Avaco from Close Up. Please note that you have an opportunity to participate in the conversation here through completion of clear and cogent questions on cards that will be picked up by members of our close-up team as we proceed today. And we'll try to get to as many of them as possible once the formal presentation is complete. Uh, Amelia and Allie will be posing questions after consultation about how to structure them. And we'll, again, we'll try to get to as many of those as possible, knowing that there's great interest on a range of questions that might be addressed here. We also have included in the brochure that you've received a copy of an assessment tool which we would very much ask you to complete as in all events here. We are looking for ways to get, to get feedback and, and response. And so we encourage you to, to drop those off on the table, probably most easily the table in the foyer outside, uh, outside this, this room. Finally, let's just turn briefly to the topic. And one of the reasons we were interested in this question of water system finance really relates to this broader issue of policy questions that link to water, but also the initiative that Dean Barr has launched called Conversations Across Difference. At a time where American society and global society is finding greater and greater difficulty in launching and sustaining constructive conversations on many of the great policy and political questions of our time, not just partisan divides, but other kinds of divides as well, the conversations across Differences Initiative supported by funding from the Provost Office is allowing us to consider a number of possible initiatives in terms of events, speakers like today, teaching opportunities and the like. And one of the things that we are realizing as we begin to explore what do we mean by conversations across difference is it means many things to many people. That can be bipartisanship or the lack of bipartisanship, other things that fracture and divide society. It also means for people, for many folks, differences between sectors, public versus private, across governmental levels, federal, state, local, international borders and boundaries. How we begin to sustain serious conversation toward development of effective public policies to cross all of these divides. Where do those conversations begin? Obviously, there are an, a, a relentless number of possible candidates, policy questions that begin to emerge water among them. And it's so interesting to think about the evolution of water policy and water governance, certainly in a state like Michigan where water has long been taken for granted. Water scarcity, unlike many parts of the world and many parts of the United States, is not seen as an issue. And think of the way that communities in this state, and for that matter across the nation, think about water, particularly drinking water quality, in the aftermath of Flint. It changes the conversation. The issues have long been there. There are a great many communities facing su substantial risks, both urban and rural. But post Flint, how do we begin to think about these issues? How do we consider governance? How do we can put together serious conversations across differences for the future of water policy? As we began to think about these questions, it was very easy to think about who would be an exceptional person to lead this part of the conversation for us. And I am absolutely just delighted to welcome back Manny Teodora T. 
to this school and to this campus. Manny holds a PhD in the dual program between the Ford School and the Department of Political Science. I had the great, great fortune of working with him as a member of his dissertation committee just a few years ago. He now is on the faculty at Texas A&M University in the Department of Political Science. And Manny has done some really, really interesting things. I could actually filibuster your remaining time, but I'm not going to do that. <laughs> in areas of public management and bureaucracy, including issues of bureaucratic ambition, the title of an award-winning book that, moved, that emerged from his dissertation, about how bureaucratic careers evolve and what impact that has for political and policy development. But an enormous amount of Manny's published research and policy engagement has been in the area of water and water quality. Long before Flint, Entered the uh, re-entered the American political lexicon as synonymous with a water disaster. Manny was on the front lines looking at water governance, water policy, the many institutions, organizational players that deal with these issues in state after state. And his life has indeed changed after Flint because that, that topic of great longstanding importance has reached even greater saliency. So he has graciously enjoy, uh, agreed to join us today and begin this conversation looking at water system finance, the political pitfalls of public-private partnerships. Please join me in welcoming Manny Theodore. <laughs> Barry, thanks so much. Thanks, Barry. That, that's a, a really, really uh, wonderful introduction. Um, it is, it is great to be back in Ann Arbor. I, uh, I had a little bit of a flashback walking into this room. This building opened during my last semester here uh, in Ann Arbor. It was 2007 and I gave a little talk. I think I sat right over there. Uh, it was part of a, a day long program. And it, it's, so it's, it's just terrific to be back here. Uh, admittedly, the weather has me missing Texas a little bit today. <laughs> Uh, that it, I could not let the weather go unnoted. Uh, I should have been maybe more strategic in choosing a date to visit, uh, but, but it, is, it really is an extra special honor. I, I get to uh, give, give a number of visiting talks uh, here and there, but it's, this is particularly special. I, I uh, finished my degree 12 years ago, uh, and it's, it, does, it feels like, oh, I get to give a talk at the Ford School. I've arrived. It took me 12 years, but I'm, but I'm here. I'm finally somebody. Uh, so anyway, thanks for having me. It's, it's wonderful to be here. And I want to also thank um, Bonnie Roberts. Are you still in the room, Bonnie? I don't know. She, she arranged everything for me, so I really appreciate her help. And also, this is the best publicity poster I've, I've ever seen. I, <laughs> so now, you, now, now you feel like you got what you were advertised. Okay, so my talk, my talk today is, is uh, as, you, as you see, it's uh, the political pitfalls of, of public-private partnerships, water system finance. And this is part of a project I've been working on with one of my graduate students, uh, Melly Hader. She's a PhD student. Uh, as, as Barry noted, I have been interested in, in water management policy for a long, long time. Uh, and maybe mo the most astonishing thing is, as, as Barry alluded to, the, the evolution of this issue in the American consciousness over the past couple of years. Uh, Maybe the most uh, surprising thing to me is that you can fill a room like this full of people to hear about water system finance. Right? That, that this was not something people cared about. Uh, th for the first 10 years or so of my academic career, I had to begin every talk I gave by explaining to people why they should care about water utilities. I don't have to do that anymore. For all the wrong reasons, people get it. Uh, and, and it's... It's, uh, it's both gratifying and, uh, and exciting to be uh, living at this moment. We are at an extraordinary moment for water infrastructure. For the first time in a generation, people are thinking about this stuff, w uh, working on it, uh, uh, talking about it. The country faces uh, daunting replacement needs. This graph, I think, is, I think is gonna uh, show a lot of what I'm talking about. The water systems that serve most of, the, of America, at least the, the urban areas of the United States, were mostly built either uh, in a couple of waves. First, uh, maybe like 100 years ago when the first water systems were being put in place. And then the, as, as uh, drinking water standards and, and uh, environmental regulations came along in the 1970s, there was a huge boom in, in construction of water facilities. And 
as this graph suggests to you, this is federal spending on water infrastructure. It, it, uh, it really exploded in the 1970s and the early 1980s. It was just massive federal funding. And a lot of the drinking water systems of, in, in the United States were paid for by Uncle Sam on 90-10 uh, matching grants. So local governments would pay 10 cents. Uncle Sam would pick up 90 cents on, out of that dollar. And those facilities, uh, those programs went away by the early 1980s, and we've seen a long and steep decline in federal spending on uh, drinking water. The idea behind these programs was that local governments would match, but then local governments would be, would be responsible, local governments that ran utilities would be responsible for maintaining, upgrading over time. They would take ownership. Uh, the federal government was there to help them get going. And there's, there's, uh, the, Something very important about the time scale here, about the, about the, the timeline, uh, these federal grants came as part of the Clean Water Act and the Safe Drinking Water Act, 1972 and 1974, respectively. The, the, the federal grants were part of those laws. And I think about that a lot because I was born the same year as the Clean Water Act. So I'm very keenly aware of how long ago that was. And when engineers build drinking water systems, they're usually designed to last 40 to 50 years. Well, guess how long it's been. We are at a stage now where infrastructure is failing in a lot of these systems and they have not been adequately maintained. The bill is coming due. The American Water Works Association estimates that we have roughly a trillion dollars in infrastructure backlog in the water sector alone over the next 20 years. As a result, water and sewer rates have climbed rapidly across the country. Uh, and the, the um, aim, the, the, some of the most egregious needs or the most severe needs are, are in uh, rural areas. Uh, it was we, when I tried to think about how to, how to phrase there, how to frame this talk in terms of conversations across difference, the obvious one is public and private sector, and we're going to get to that. But a, part of what, a big part of what I'm going to talk about today is urban and rural large systems, small systems, and the very different ways in which we provide water to different communities of different sizes. Main point is that there's an overdue infrastructure bill in this country, and that the bill is coming due. There is something else going on. Barry also alluded to this. This is the, the public face of drinking water in America. Now, I, I think it's, yeah, I don't have to tell an, a Michigan audience about the Flint water crisis, but the, you may be surprised. I don't have to tell anybody in the United States about the Flint water crisis. You talk to anyone across the country about drinking water, the first word that's going to come out of their mouth is Flint. This, this is how people think about drinking water, and it, is, it has changed the way people relate to their utilities. I've, I've done some interesting little research on utilities uh, in, in different parts of the country actually think about their own drinking water systems in terms of Flint. So it's, it's uh, very much a, a drinking water quality issue. But of course, Flint is not just about drinking water uh, quality. It's also about poverty, and it's about race. Uh, it's about environmental justice. It's really hard to overstate how important the Flint has been for changing the national conversation about water. I tell people, look, this is the, this is the Cuyahoga River fire of our generation. Drinking water didn't, didn't suddenly become important when the Flint water crisis happened. It was always important. It's just now people are paying attention. It's the same way the Cuyahoga River fire inspired the Clean Water Act, uh, brought national attention to water pollution. The Flint water crisis is doing something very similar about, uh, uh, about drinking water. I want to show you just a couple graphs from a study that I published a couple years ago. Uh, on, on the relationship between race, uh, socioeconomic status, and, um, and Safe Drinking Water Act compliance. On the left-hand side, you see uh, uh, the percent black population. On the right-hand side, we've got the percent Hispanic population of communities. And then on, on the y-axis, we've, uh, we've got the percent of the population below poverty. And what you see here is those, uh, uh, those, those violations, those Safe Drinking Water Act violations, tend to happen in the places that are uh, predominantly non-white and predominantly poor. So we've got, uh, in addition to the traditional supporters of infrastructure, we've now got a coalition of folks recognizing this is a social justice issue, it's an environmental justice issue, it, that, that drinking water is also about race and poverty. So over the last three years, hardly a week has gone by without a major news outlet running a story on drinking water. That, I'm telling you, is weird. I've been working on this stuff for a long time. It used to be obscure. Now it's front page news. And someone else has noticed, too. 
you just don't recognize this handsome guy. This is, uh, this is Gavin Newsom. He's the new governor of, of California. Uh, just uh, earlier this month, uh, Governor Newsom uh, took his entire cabinet meeting out on a tour of rural water systems. Your own governor, your, your new governor here, has, uh, who, who ran on a water infrastructure platform. Right? That was a convenient thing for someone in Michigan, perhaps, but it's convenient for folks elsewhere, too. Uh, you, President uh, Trump's uh, wa uh, infrastructure plan last year included a large section on water infrastructure. People in the water industry, we're not used to presidents giving this kind of love to our, to our sector. You talk, tend to talk about uh, infrastructure in terms of roads and bridges. Roads and bridges, roads and bridges. We, I, I use, got this term I call Rosen bridges, which is the way that politicians tend to think about infrastructure because roads and bridges are very visible. Politicians are paying attention to water. Uh, Senator Harris, uh, also in the news recently for her ambitions, introduced a bill on water affordability uh, last year. And you, know, you don't have to be a political scientist to know that when politicians, ambitious politicians, are talking about an issue, it's because they know that the public perceives the issue to be important. None of these people is a renowned water geek. Okay? None of these folks is a water engineer. They are drawn to this topic because it is now publicly important. Okay. So, there is a growing consensus that existing infrastructure funding, uh, infra inst funding institutions are failing. That's the whole reason we've got a crisis. So much of the conversation uh, at this point is what do we do about that? And a couple of the options that are getting a lot of attention, especially in the White House's infrastructure plan, are privatization and perhaps public-private partnerships. That's going to be the focus of my talk today. Pure privatization is when infrastructure, in this case a water system, uh, is owned by a private individual or an investor-owned corporation. Privatization can bring an instantaneous, uh, instantaneous capital infusion to a struggling water system. When a private corporation buys a water system, it takes, it takes on and, and owns that system, literally owns the pipes and the reservoirs and the treatment facilities, and can bring to bear an enormous amount of funding immediately. A big part of privatization's appeal is that in the immediate cash infusion, but also that private corporations bring uh, an expertise and, and their profit motive is supposed to drive efficiency. But of course, privatization, especially in something as, as essential as water, also it gets to be an emotional issue and it sort of conjures some negative images. Think about, about what, evil robber barons, right? Like a lot of mustache twirling and so on with, with private corporations. So I think there's a fear a visceral and understandable fear about private corporations owning something that is as essential, literally essential, as drinking water. By contrast, there's the public-private partnership. It's a main topic of, of today's talk. So these things, I'm, I'm going to call them sometimes P3s or triple P's, public-private partnerships. Uh, the word partnership, right? Partnership sounds good. Right? Who could be against a partnership? Partnership. Public-private partnership seems the, like the idea of coupling private expertise and efficiency with democratic governance. That all seems very appealing. Public-private partnership seems like mom and apple pie, right? It's very difficult to, to disagree with the idea of a public-private partnership. And I think there's a tendency in the discussion of P3s to focus on finance and, and efficiency, and we should. Those things are very, very important. But I'm today going to focus on the oft-overlooked political dimension of public-private partnerships and try to trace out the political incentives that, that P3 institutions create. So as a policy scholar, I am interested in operational and financial dimensions of P3s, but as a political scientist, I'm interested in the way public-private partnerships incentivize behavior. All right, so here's where we're going for the balance of the talk today. I'm going to start by telling you all a little bit about the water sector in America, how it's structured and how the economics and governance of water utilities is very different from other kinds of utilities. I'm going to talk about the institutions and incentives for public utilities, private utilities, and public-private partnerships. What I'm going to be talking about today, I'm going to keep using the word utility. What I mean is water utility. Okay? That, some of what I'm saying can also apply to other kinds of utilities, but I'm going to focus on, on water and, uh, and wastewater today. Then I'm going to show you some analysis of how ownership relates to Safe Drinking Water Act compliance and which kinds of models are generating 
the, the sort of the best water quality outcomes. Talk about the implications, broader implications and applications of these ideas. So let's start with, the, uh, with system ownership. So I think when, when you talk with most people about, certainly before, before Flint, when you talk with folks about utilities, they tend, tend to think immediately of electricity, maybe gas. Uh, the, and that's because historically those have been more expensive services. Uh, maybe we think about telecom. We don't spend as much time thinking about water. And water is in a lot of ways very, very different from energy. And it's, it's different, in, different in a lot of ways, uh, but, but I'm going to point out just a couple that are interesting from organizational perspectives. First thing to know about water utilities is there's a lot of them. There's just a lot of water systems in the United States. Depending on how you count things, there are between 3,000 and 3,500 3, 3, electrical utilities in the United States. You know, 3,000 to 3,500, some, somewhere in that range. There are 50,000 uh, community water systems in the United States. So we're talking about an order of magnitude, more than an order of magnitude, more organizations serving, uh, serving uh, the American public. About 85% of Americans get their drinking water from a local government. That's the other difference. That ratio is almost exactly opposite, about 85% in, in energy. About 85% of Americans get their electrical utility service from a private corporation. About 85% of Americans get their drinking water service from a government. So the organizations that are providing these services are very different and, and corporations and governments face very different kinds of constraints and incentives. So in sheer numbers, we're talking about a, a huge difference and a difference in ownership. The other thing to know about these systems is that the overwhelming majority of drinking water systems are very, very small. So this is how things break down by size. These are size categories that the EPA uses for various record keeping and, and regulatory purposes. You see about half of the US population is served by 434 utilities. It's, it's a very small number of very, very large systems that serve a lot of people. 40,000 systems are tiny. They serve fewer than 3,300 people. And organizationally, those, those systems are very different. They tend to, they, if they have any full-time staff at all, there's maybe one or two people in a pickup truck, right? That's who's running those systems. So uh, the, the other system, you know, we see about, about half of the, the country is served by these sort of small and medium-sized systems between 3,300 and 50,000. But the, the main thing to point out here, again, 40,000 of these systems, uh, 40,000 of the roughly 50,000 systems are really, really small. And that's a, a very different kind of setup as, from what we have in the energy sector. The focus of my talk today is going to be on these large and medium-sized systems. I think the structural issues with very, very small, those tiny, tiny systems, they're very different. I mean, they're, 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 they're in most cases not autonomous organizations at all. So it, in some ways, it's very difficult to talk about management and policy challenges at that scale. They are worth studying and evaluating, but my talk today is going to be focused on 3,300 and up, which covers most of the U.S. population. Finally, here's how size and ownership relate. Those large systems are, are, mostly, are mostly public. Well, actually, uh, all of the systems are, are mostly public, but there's a correlation between ownership and size as size uh, increases, private ownership decreases. So most of the private, uh, private utilities tend to be uh, the small and medium size systems. And the thing to know about public-private partnerships is they're relatively rare. There are not a lot of them. However, more and more communities are considering public-private partnerships. It's certainly in the water industry, the private industry side is, is promoting uh, public-private partnerships as a, as a path forward. So at this point, it's probably time for me to, to define you know, what a P3 is, right? I'm 20 minutes into the talk or 15 minutes. Into the talk. I probably should define my key, my key topic, right? So public-private partnerships. Now, it's a, it's a, it's a surprisingly difficult thing to, 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 to define. If you look at the literature in public-private partnerships, there are lots of definitions, and it's hard to pin down because they come in near infinite varieties. Public-private partnerships take a lot of forms in a lot of different sectors of the economy. It's very hard to, to, to uh, come up with a, a universal uh, um, uh, definition. 
So what I'm going to talk about, uh, instead of trying to come up with a universal definition, I'm going to talk about the most common form of public-private partnership in the water sector. So water and wastewater systems, uh, they, there tends to be the typical form for a, a public-private partnership, and it looks like this. It's usually the form of some kind of a contract agreement between a local government and a private corporation. And here's how the relationship works. The local government owns the facilities, the water facilities, that's the treatment plant, the pipes, the meters. The, uh, the, the reservoirs, anything, all, any of the physical capital that's necessary to deliver water. The government also makes investment decisions. It decides when to expand, when to maintain, and critically for our purposes, it also makes the pricing decisions. It decides what water costs. It decides on the water rate structure. The private partner, private sector partner, is a private corporation that will operate the facilities. So it, it acts as, a, as a, an operator. They have the, the people who actually run the system. Uh, the extent to which the private operator uh, carries out different elements of the, of, the, of the system depends on the contract. So each pu public-private partnership is a little different. These things are negotiated on an ad hoc basis by lawyers for, for local governments and for, uh, for the private firms that contract with them. Uh, P3s, they go by various names, uh, but you'll sometimes see them called simply operating contracts. They'll say they have an operating contractor. Sometimes this is called a franchise agreement. Uh, very, uh, if, if it involves a newer or larger project, it might be called a DBO, if you ever hear that, uh, that abbreviation. That sounds, stands for Design, Build, Operate, where you're, you're contracting with a private firm to design the facility, build the facility, operate the facility. They have a bunch of different names. But this is the most common model of P3 in water. There are other models, but this is the one you see most often. Now, when governments engage in public-private partnerships, or at least when they're considering them, we usually see a combination of rationale behind the choice to pursue a P3. And uh, there's a pretty robust literature in economics, public management. If you've ever heard the phrase new public management, it was very interested in, in what contracting arrangements could do. And the rationale usually goes like this. You go to a P3 because uh, a private firm can bring human capital in ways that in improve quality, especially if you're a smaller government. A large corporation has a lot of expertise they can bring to bear on your small system that you may not have in, in your local community. So that's, that's a big improvement in quality, potentially. Second, we hear a lot about the profit motive, right? That the profit, like a pro profit-seeking firm, a profit-maximizing firm ought to be efficient. That, that market discipline will cause them to operate efficiently in a way that local governments maybe don't. And then we like to say, well, but well, we get the benefit of democracy, local control, essential service, essential good, water. We want to keep control over that, that thing. We want to control, want control over pricing. We want control over investment, citing decisions. And so that, that uh, we, we get to retain that local democratic control. And that's that mom and apple pie, right? We get all these nice things with public-private partnership. And it sounds good. It appeals to labor and management alike, Republicans and Democrats, cats and dogs. Everybody likes P3s. Now, as you saw earlier, the overwhelming majority of public water systems are owned by local governments. And those systems, therefore, are managed and operated by local bureaucrats. The system policies are set by local elected officials, mayors, city councils, county commissions, special district boards. Crucially for our purposes, we keep remembering it's, this, it's the pricing and investment decisions fall to public agencies. So these decisions are made out of city hall. The governance for pro public water utilities are made in city halls and boardrooms around the country. Private investor-owned utilities are owned by private firm managers and employees. So policies are set by corporate executives and corporate boards of directors. But crucially, investment decisions in the private utility are made jointly between the utilities management and a public utilities commission. These things take different names in, in different states, uh, but in, here's the California Public Utilities Commission. It's one of the biggest. Pricing and investment decisions are made with the PUC. So private corporations that serve uh, the pure, purely private water utilities don't get to just set prices whatever they want. They have to work with public utilities commissions. More on that in just a moment. Actually, not just a moment. We'll do it right now. Pricing for private water utilities. Look, this is going to have to get down in the weeds just a tiny bit because this is really important to understand the broader point I want to make. 
Utilities are natural monopolies. If we, let the, if we let a privately owned water utility just charge whatever it wanted for water, water would be inefficiently expensive because they would just take advantage, the private ownership would take advantage of its, its monopoly position and just charge people a lot of money for water. And so we have laws in the United States that require uh, uh, utility prices to be set at what's called cost of service. So we, they, they require cost of service pricing and the Public Utilities Commission puts a limit on how much the utility can charge. And here they follow a formula. It gets very complicated, but it all boils down to a very simple formula. They're allowed to charge the operating cost of the facilities. So if it costs me a million dollars, to run the water system, I get to charge a million dollars to the customers of the water system. In addition to my operating cost, I get to make a profit. Because I'm a private ownership, I'm a pri because of private ownership, I get to make a profit, but that profit is limited by statute. The Public Utilities Commission allows me to earn a rate of return, you know, maybe something like 4% or 5% or 10%, some percentage, multiplied by the capital rate base. Capital rate base turns out to be really important. That's the money I put into the system. If it costs me uh, uh, $100,000 to buy a piece of equipment and I'm allowed to earn 5% uh, of rate of return, that means in addition to my operating cost, I get $5,000. So I got $100,000 times my rate of return, 5%, I get $5,000 on top of my operating cost. That's the way cost of service pricing works. That's gonna become very important in just a moment. For now, let's go to P3s. P3s are effectively governed by a combination of local governments and courts. Utilities commissions are not involved in public-private partnerships. So the, the courts are involved in so far as they have to adjudicate over the contracting relationship between the local government and the private firm. So the private firm operates the system in exchange for a fee or the right to collect revenue. They, get, they, they agree for a million dollars a year, we'll run your water system. The local government makes the investment and in pricing decisions and the courts just adjudicate conflicts. Now, for purposes of environmental quality, all of them are subject to the same environmental regulations. Safe Drinking Water Act applies to all these utilities regardless of ownership. There's one more key thing to know about water systems, as I lay out the groundwork here, one more key thing to know about water as a matter of public policy that makes it very different from, say, roads and bridges. And that is, with water, the cost or the price is much more visible than quality. You drive over a pothole, you know it. Most of the contaminants in drinking water are invisible to us. Unless water gets really, 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 really dirty, you don't know if it's contaminated. However, the price of water is very easily and immediately observable. I may not know what contaminants are in my water unless I'm some kind of a, a chemist, but I for sure know what I'm paying for it. I get my bill at the end of every month, I see what it costs me. So the price is very visible, the quality, not so much. Unless there's a water main break on my street, unless I get a boil water notice, I probably just kind of more or less figure the water's fine, right? And, it's a, a, and, and so I don't really have a good sense of quality. All right, that's, that's the big wind-up. It's a long wind-up. We're going to get to the get to the pitch here now. What does all that mean for institutions and incentives? Let's get political sciencey for a minute. Trace through the incentives that these institutions create for water quality. Let's start with public incentives. I'm going to draw from a, 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 a kind of an obscure but really brilliant little article by a guy called Cotton Lindsay in 1976, who traced out a logic of public enterprises like like water utilities. Public enterprises, anytime the government operates something that operates on a, on a government owns and operates something that, that uses a fee for service basis, like a, like a public university, a, a public enterprise. So he's got, we're, like, a, like any uh, political scientist, he was a, an economist, but uh, like, any, like most political scientists, he began with the assumption that the people who make deci the decisions are elected officials and their goal is re-election. So we just assume that the, uh, the people who govern these systems want to get re-elected. And the way you do that, if you're running a water system, you want to do two things. You want to minimize the price and maximize quality, right? People like to pay low prices and they like to get high quality things. That's not just true for water, that's true generally. We like high quality and low prices. So the politician who wants to get reelected wants to minimize price and maximize quality. However, we observed a moment ago 
that price is much more visible than quality. It's very difficult for people to gauge the quality of their water. It's very easy for them to gauge the price. That leads to uh, a, a ignore, ignoring uh, the quality dimension and focusing on price. The decisions that follow then are to reduce operating costs, minimize capital investment, and defer maintenance. The result is long run, low prices, but also low quality. In many ways, this article from 1976 presaged the drinking water infrastructure crisis we have today. There's no political incentive to it reinvest in a water system if it's going to cause rates to go up. And there's every incentive as an elected official to think, ah, what are the odds that I'm going to have a Flint water crisis during my time in office? Probably pretty small. That's my successor's problem, not my problem. And so this, we end up with low prices and low quality. And Lindsay argues, inefficiently low prices, inefficiently low quality. If people had the alternative to make private market decisions, they would pay more and get higher quality. Maybe says something about the appeal of kiosk or, or bottled water. Private utilities face a very different decision logic. And I'm going to introduce you to a couple of more economists uh, in a more famous model, uh, the Average Johnson model. So professors Average and Johnson observed that uh, unlike, unlike uh, public agencies, the goal of a private firm is profit, right? Or growth. They want to grow revenue. They want to make a profit. To maximize profit, of course, they want to maximize price. And to maximize growth, they want to maximize quality. By having high quality, you can appeal to more customers. You can expand your, uh, your uh, market. So from a management's perspective, the decisions that follow are to have moderate operating costs. You don't want them high because that, that'll eat into your profit, but you don't want them too low because that'll hurt quality. You want to maximize capital investment and maximize maintenance. And the reason why, remember that cost of service formula? The th rate of return multiplied by your rate base is the profit that you are allowed to make. These two things, capital investment and, and maintenance, go into your rate base. If I put a million dollars, reinvest a million dollars into my system, that goes into the rate base. I get to earn a rate of return on that million dollars. So I have every incentive to invest and invest and invest and invest. And the Public Utilities Commission will allow me to earn a rate of return and set my rates in such a way as I make a profit on that investment. The result, say Average and Johnson, is high prices, but also very high quality. But they're inefficiently high prices because it creates an incentive to what they, they call it gold plating. They'll gold plate the system. Instead of having a double redundant uh, reservoir, I'll have a quadruple redundant reservoir. It'll be a wonderful, wonderful reservoir and it'll be able to handle the 2000 year flood but uh, the prices are going to be very, very high. So inefficiently high prices. So those are the incentives in place, and there's a good body of empirical and theoretical research affirming both of these findings. We know that empirically this tends to be the case. Private water, higher priced, a lot of research that shows that, but I've had some recent research that shows they also tend to generate higher quality than the public sector. What about P3s? about the incentives for public-private partnerships. Well, remember that in theory, a public-private partnership is supposed to combine these nice things, human capital, a profit motive for efficiency, and, and local control for democracy. There's a lot of reason to think that human capital, that works. I've got some other research I'm not going to talk about today, but there's a lot of, re, re, lot, a lot of evidence that human, the private, uh, public-private partnerships are delivering on human capital. However, the profit motive and efficiency, uh, and efficiency, the local control and democracy, that's the subject of my, uh, my concern today. For the public part of the P3, here's how it looks. I'm going to look at the government side. Um, here we still have a re-election incentive, but now quality is no longer the local government's concern. They've contracted with a private firm. The private firm is now responsible for water quality, so their only goal is to minimize price which means they want to reduce operating costs, and they're going to do that by working with a private firm. But they still have an incentive to minimize investment. They still have an incentive to minimize uh, maintenance expenditures so that they can achieve the outcome of low prices. Because remember, under these P3s, the pricing is decision is still with the local government. So the smart decision is to keep prices low and put the squeeze on your private contractor. Let's turn to the private contractor for a second. Now they, of course, still want to maximize rates and maximize quality, but they don't control rates anymore. 
They don't even get to work with the Public Utilities Commission. Now the local government sets rates. They might still want to maximize quality, but the decision, the smart decision now is, uh, is to reduce operating costs because they have no way to, to control capital investment and maximize maintenance. They can go to the local government and say, hey, local government, we'd really like to reinvest in the system, but that decision is up to the local government, not to the private contractor. Now recall that these contracts work on a fixed fee basis. You pay me a million dollars to run your system. The only way I can grow my profit is to reduce operating costs. I know that I'm only going to get a fixed amount of money each year. The only way I can grow my profit is to reduce operating costs. So I now have every incentive to run at the bare minimum. Get the least skilled employees I possibly can so I don't have to pay them very much. Maintain as little as possible. Take care of the system as little as possible. The more I do that, the more money I make. So the outcome will be Low prices, I won't be able to raise to high prices, but now I'm balancing my goal of maximizing quality to grow my market share against my need to make a profit and my incentive to reduce operating costs. So you put that all together and these models suggest that P3s are going to result in low prices, high quality management to the extent that they, private firms bring a lot of human capital to the equation, but still low water quality and st still systematically underinvested uh, uh, capital, underinvestment in capital. Now, I, I don't have the time or the data to go into every dimension of this model, so I'm just going to focus on the quality dimensions for the remainder of my talk. As I mentioned earlier, the main law governing drinking water quality in the United States is the Safe Drinking Water Act of 1974. It's like most environmental laws in the United States. It involves a series of technology-based standards. I'm going to take a very complicated law and boil it down to two things, health standards and management or monitoring standards. Uh, health violations on the Safe Drinking Water Act occur when you exceed the maximum allowable contaminants in the drinking water or you fail to use uh, approved treatment technology. Management violations occur if you fail to take appropriate water samples, report in a timely fashion, and, and uh, give information about water quality to your community. So those are the two kinds of violations that can occur, two species of violations can occur under the Safe Drinking Water Act. We're going to look at both of them because they tell us different things. So health violations tell us about water quality. Management violations tell us about management quality because they're strictly procedural. They have to do with management systems. Based on what I've just laid out about P3s, here's what we would expect about P3 performance relative to the public. We'd expect health violations to be about the same because the incentives in place are about the same as they are for public sector, but we'd expect my management violations perhaps to decline because we're getting human capital from the private sector. So, we, uh, to, to, to get after this, we analyzed Safe Drinking Water Act compliance data for eight years, 2010 to 2017. Our data source was the EPA Safe Drinking Water Information System. We uh, were interested in the different kinds of utilities, different sizes, their water sources. Ownership, of course, we're focused on ownership in this analysis. And we're, we're going to look at the violations and compliance with the Safe Drinking Water Act because we know a lot about the way demographics predict drinking water quality. We uh, also uh, use the American Community Survey to get some demographic controls. And uh, we, we do a bunch of statistical modeling and hocus pocus with statistics. And we, we, uh, we did some analysis to see the correlation between ownership. What was the relationship between public, private, P3 models and outcomes with a Safe Drinking Water Act? I'm not going to bother you with more gory details of st statistics. I can answer questions if you want. For now, allow me to lay some results upon you. This is health violations under the Safe Drinking Water Act, evaluated at a population of 4,200, those smallish systems where, those small systems where P3s are really growing. Here is average vi health violations for publicly owned, privately owned, and public-private partnerships. As you can see here, private investor-owned utilities experience significantly fewer violations per year. This is, the, this is a modeled number of violations per year, annual health violations, uh, Safe Drinking Water Act. The private uh, uh, getting about uh, 0.11 on average compared to 0.17 for public. 
thing to know about health violations, these are rare events. Happily, they don't happen very often. Uh, but they happen significantly more often in publicly owned utilities than in privately owned utilities. And that's consistent with what earlier findings, uh, what, what I found in the past, what other scholars have found in the past. The difference is percentage terms is pretty significant. It's about a 35% difference. To put it in a, another way, the difference between public and private is about one violation per decade versus one violation every six years. So that's, that's a pretty substantial difference. But you notice public-private partnerships, we're not getting a significant difference between public and, and P3s. You know, it's a huge confidence interval because there are not a whole lot of public-private partnerships, but we also don't see a very big substantive difference between the two. Uh, here's a marginal effects plot showing the same thing. This is private versus public. If you're not used to looking at marginal effects. So what this is telling you is over the, over the, uh, the scale of population, of the range of population of utilities, what difference is there between private and public? Remember, small numbers are good. We don't want violations. This is like golf. You want small scores, right? The change in, uh, between private and public is negative across the range. That's telling you that private is committing fewer violations than public, and the biggest differences are at the low end of the distribution. Here's a P3s versus public. Again, substantively not much difference, no statistically significant difference in health violations. Let's move on to management. Management violations, we see a different story. The first thing we see, uh, the, the, what we'd expect, the difference between public and private, we get fewer uh, management violations. Management violations are much more common than health violations. That's good in as much as we don't want health violations. But management violations are much more common. But we see now, at both a sub, we, have, we see a large substantial drop in management violations with public-private partnerships. And that, I think, tells us something about that human capital story that's going on. You're getting much more professional management. We just barely miss statistical significance, but, uh, but in substantive terms, that's, that's pretty good. Statistical significance by 95% standards. Uh, here's the marginal effects plot again. There's public versus private, or private rather versus public. And here's a P3 versus public, and we're just barely scraping that, uh, that statistical significance line. So, important to, couple, to acknowledge a couple things about this analysis. First of all, with the data at hand, I cannot rule out the possibility that the, the utilities that have P3s are qualitatively different in some important way. It could be the case that the P3 systems are absolutely horrible when the private corporations take over operations and that maybe things would have been a lot worse without them. I can't rule that out. IRB is not gonna let me randomly assign ownership to, to water utility systems, so it's very difficult for me to say with confidence exactly what the causality is uh, here. So that, that is one possibility for those of you who care about these things. We have tried uh, propensity score matching and weighting and we see the same results. Um, it's difficult to imagine what an instrument or instrumental variable for utility ownership might be. So, so it's, it, this is the best we can do with observational data. These things change ownership so, so seldom that it's very difficult to get traction over time in that sense. Um, there is plenty of qualitative evidence, however, that the political logic tied to rates is a big part of what's driving public-private partnerships. We see case after case where this kind of logic is at play, that it's the politics of pricing, not the politics of water quality, that drive P3 decisions. To show you that, I, I want to show you something I just ran across three days ago. It's a marvelous representation evidence of the logic at hand. This is a, I found a website called p3guide.com. Is it .com? Yes, .com, p3guide.com. This was developed apparently by some, some researchers at the Kennedy School uh, who uh, apparently have a lot of uh, experience fostering public-private partnerships, and they set up this website to help local officials decide whether a P3 was right for them. So they have a bunch of decision tools where you can click through and it'll ask you questions like, do you care about this or more than that? Do you care about that more than this? And it'll go through and tell you whether a P3 is a good idea for you or not. One of the things that's wonderful, they have decision tools about pricing, decision tools about capital investment, but they have a political decision tool as well. Here's the first question that comes up on the political decision tool. Okay, so you can't read it. It says, does the project span multiple political jurisdictions and is it likely to affect multiple political stakeholders? 
And I want to show you the last, the last sentence here. It says, if the project impacts multiple political stakeholders like organized labor, environmental community, permitting agencies, and so on, you may want to shift the burden to the private project developer to avoid political impacts. No mention of quality, no mention of pricing. Do you want to avoid political responsibility for this infrastructure? The P3 is right for you, my friend. <laughs> How about this? This is the next question. Do you anticipate crippling constituent dissatisfaction or pressure? Your constituents will no doubt be displeased if you raise their taxes and user fees to create new fees, tolls, and charges for services they used to receive for free. Or if you used to charge them $30 a month for water and sewer, you charge them $90 a month, they're going to be really unhappy. If so, you may consider deflecting the, political, the potential constituent displeasure to a private project developer. I just published a paper, uh, still forthcoming, with a couple of my grad students called Political Decoupling. And it looked at the, uh, the conservation performance of public and private utilities in California. We found that private utilities outconserved public utilities during the drought. And we trace it back to this logic. Private utilities, they can set the prices whatever they want. The, the PUC is going to let them set the prices. But if you are a public utility and you save a bunch of water during the drought because it's an emergency, but then you don't sell a bunch of water so you lose a bunch of money, the constituents are going to be angry at you. And I cannot tell you, as a political scientist, how rare this is. We sort of spin Machiavellian tales in our heads about how pol political decision makers think about things. We so rarely have the logic spelled out in black and white for us right here. My God, it's the conspiracy theory put in right there online for us. Do a P3. It'll let you avoid political responsibility. So for communities struggling with water system finance, um, facing daunting infrastructure needs, I'm going to close with a couple of thoughts here on the implications of all of this. Uh, and, and I think it's important to think about the political incentives that P3s create, because goodness knows the P3 proponents are thinking about the politics here. So are P3s good, good or bad idea? I think it's most useful to ask what they're good for and what they're not good for. It's not that they're necessarily in themselves good or bad, but there are some good reasons and some bad reasons to pursue them. So what are some good reasons to pursue uh, public-private partnerships? I think there's really one very, very good reason to pursue a public-private partnership, and that's human capital. There are parts of the United States where there are counties in the United States where you cannot buy a qualified water operator or, or a civil engineer for any price. In those contexts where you are severely lacking in human capital, especially in a smaller system, a public-private partnership is a way to get expertise into your community very quickly, uh, very, very effectively. It's a very good way to retain high, highly qualified individuals, and we know that they can help utilities perform better. Big company can run lots of small and medium-sized systems. I think we're accustomed to think about economies of scale in terms of brick and mortar and pipes, but there's enormous economies of scale to organizations as well. Bad reasons to pursue public-private partnership. I'm going to just talk about two of them very briefly. The first is I often worry that the main reason that people pursue public-private partnership is a bad reason, not a good one, and they think that it's going to cause money to fall from the sky. Privatization and public-private partnerships are not sources of capital. In the end, the money comes from the same people. It's going to come from the water customer. How it gets from the water customer's pocket to the utility changes depending on whether you've got public-private or public-private partnership. But one way or another, the money's coming from the same people. It is not a capital financing alternative. It is an organizational model. But a public-private partnership will not instantaneously create money. Under public-private partnerships, the rate increases are still going to be needed to fund infrastructure, or else the systems will continue to fail. We will not solve the infrastructure problems. And that brings us maybe to the worst reason of all to pursue a public-private partnership. Thank you to P3 Guide for letting, laying it out so clearly, and that is to avoid accountability. P3s are not privatization light. They very, create and sustain very different political incentives from pure privatization. 
and it is so it is a fundamentally different institutional arrangement. Bottom line, I, as you probably have get, uh, gathered, I'm not a big fan of public-private partnerships in the water sector. I think there are some very strong arguments for private ownership and management. I think there are some very strong arguments for public ownership and management. I do not see in most circumstances public-private partnerships providing long-term solutions and those have nothing to do with economies of scale or organizational, uh, or organizational management. They have everything to do with the political incentives that are in place with P3s. Okay. P3s often touted as offering the best of both worlds. I think in many ways they offer the worst. So, I think, am I on time? I'm a little, little over. I've got some time for questions, I guess. Very good. Yeah, great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, thank you so much um, for speaking to us today. My name is Amelia Essenstead. I'm a second year Master's of Public Policy student here at the Ford School, and I um, took Dr. Rabe's public management class last year. Um, one question we have is, how can we make quality more visible to consumers and voters? That is a great question, and it's, it's one I'm thinking about a lot. How can we make quality more, more visible? I actually just, uh, I've just, I just blogged about this recently. The state of New Jersey just passed something called the Water Quality Accountability Act. And it is the first state to adopt a statewide law requiring that all public utilities uh, post performance information on a variety of dimensions in a way that makes their performance not just Safe Drinking Water Act compliance, but things like system water loss, exact levels of chemical contaminants in various dimensions, number of water main breaks, all these kinds of things will be publicly, um, pub publicly available. And what that's going to do is allow us, the research community, to draw a clearer line between an investment decision and the water quality impact. I was part of a team that proposed an NSF uh, uh, project that sadly was not funded. Uh, that would have it was a multiple multiple disciplinary team where we were going to use uh, sort of cloud-based microdata on things like uh, 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 purchases of Pepto Bismol and water system quality. Right? And, and people getting on Facebook and Twitter and complaining about being sick, and then water system performance. And our goal with all of this is to try to draw that line more brightly. One of the things I think is so fascinating about water, 100 years ago, 125, 130 years ago, when Americans were not accustomed to getting drinking water, politicians used to brag about building and investing in drinking water systems. Anybody here from Saginaw? Nobody from Saginaw. So Saginaw is, I love telling this story about Saginaw. So Saginaw built a drinking water plant in, uh, I want to say in a 1912, 1913, something like this, about a hundred, a little over a hundred years ago. And I've read an article about this, about at the hundredth anniversary of the Saginaw drinking water plant. And it's wonderful to look at because there's these old grainy black and white pictures when they opened this treatment plant and they had a parade, like with marching bands. And they had, uh, people used to have to pump water from the middle of town in these, these hand pumps. And they had, as part of the parade, a hearse with a hand pump in it. <laughs> and they ceremonially buried the hand pump. And there's this picture of the guys with the black top hats and, and they're shaking hands and, and they're burying this thing. And there's a huge crowd and they're applauding. And, and, and the sign of the Saginaw, on front of the Saginaw Water Treatment Plant, brand new plant, says the world's best water. And one of the three guys in this picture is the mayor. One of them is the governor of Michigan. And they're all there celebrating with this huge crowd. Politicians love to claim credit for stuff. What's happened in the intervening hundred years is politicians no longer want to claim credit for water. They want to avoid blame. Avoiding blame is a very different kind of incentive. Now the game is not claim credit for bringing you better health and a better life. Now the game is you know, it's like, it's, play, it's like playing a game where you, you're holding the timer and you don't want it to go off, and then you, like, you hand it to the next person, hope that, that it goes off while they're holding. It's like a hot potato game. So how can we make things more visible? I think the answer is a lot of data transparency and analysis. I have a lot of friends who work in the water utility industry. They're very, very nervous about this prospect. 
They don't like the idea of people looking at a lot of performance information on their, at their systems. But I think we need to change that. We need to make performance information something that we celebrate so it gives people a reason to claim credit for good performance, not just avoid credit for avoid blame for bad performance. So lots and lots of data transparency. That was a long answer. <laughs> data. There's the short one. Great, thanks. Um, my name is Allie Waters. I'm also a second year MPP student and took Dr. Rabe's class uh, last year, um, but also have a background in my undergrad in economics and environmental studies. So this is really interesting talk for me. Um, so thanks for being here. Uh, we have a question about um, competing public utilities and specifically how competing public utilities contribute to the future of P3s in your opinion. So, for example, uh, LA Metropolitan versus San Diego County Water Authority. Oh, yeah. um, what kind of role does that play for P3's future? Boy, that's not something I've thought about before. Water systems are natural monopolies, so we don't see a lot of competition. Mm -hmm. right? You're never going to see a consumer choice model for water the way you see with, say, telecom. Credit goes to a student from Dr. Rabe's class for a asking that stumping question. <laughs> yeah, like there's no spot market for water. That's the other thing. There's no national grid for water. Mm -hmm. The state of Michigan better hope it stays that way because the rest of the country's coming for your lakes. Uh, the uh, yeah, I don't know because I get the two examples that you mentioned. Uh, the question mentioned are wholesalers. They are not retail water utilities. LA Metropolitan and San Diego County, County Water Authority are, are, um, are wholesalers. They don't have uh, private customers. They sell to water, other water utilities. So they own big uh, uh, resource uh, uh, works and reservoirs, and then they sell water to the local governments and private utilities in their area. And so they can compete to some extent. I have not thought about what that would mean for quality. So I, I, don't, I don't have a good answer for you on that because, yeah, these agencies are more or less insulated. Um, they, don't, they tend to be governed by appointed boards, not elected officials. So I, I, I don't know. Good question. <laughs> I, I guess the, 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 the really short answer is there's not a lot of competition. In reality, the, except in some weird kind of border cases, people don't compete for water companies. You don't move into Ann Arbor and decide, well, do I want Ann Arbor water? Do I want Detroit water? Right? Do I want Lansing water? Do I, you, know, you, you got the water you got. Um, another question from a current student. How do you think rural areas or even urban areas of depleting populations can best tackle declining infrastructure and higher costs, even when they don't have enough people to serve the system or make it less costly? Yeah, really, really hard problem. Really hard problem. The, the stranded capital problem. Right? You have a city like Detroit that's designed for two or three million people, and instead it has, what, seven, eight hundred thousand? There's no easy answer to this one. The best you can do is, is I think, what we've seen in, in Michigan, which is a regionalization. Spread that cost over as large a population as you can. It's not a panacea, right? but it, it, can, it can help. Uh, the, the, you, know, you, you have very little. You can do certain things to try to control the numerator in this problem. You can try to control costs. You can try to gain efficiencies. But our levers are, are much bigger on the denominator, right? We can, we can try to expand the number of customers through regionalization. Uh, but in the end, I mean, in, these, in the cases with extreme population loss in the short term, that may be a case where, you know, state or federal intervention for, for capital support is going to be uh, maybe the only alternative to solve these water quality problems. Uh, so, so this one, I think, speaks bit more to the community aspect of um, managing these problems and, and what the public can do. So do you imagine that public pressure could ever effectively alter the incentive structure, um, particularly for politicians, um, in such a way that would improve quality of water? Yeah, I think, I, I think it can. I, I'm a basically an optimistic guy, uh, and I like to think that presented with enough information, people will care about these things. I, look. Drinking water is not a real ideological issue, right? Whatever your partisan leanings, you like to drink water and cook and flush your toilet and take a shower. That's not particularly partisan. So I think this is a case where 
I think presented with the right information and framed in the right way, there will be public support for these things. Let me, and, and I think a lot of this, let me get, I want to circle back. I think this relates to this question about stranded capital and what these things really cost. Look, water prices are going up. They're going up dramatically. They're going up fast. For people who are economically marginalized, it's a real challenge. The, the difference between $40 a month, $60 a month makes a lot of difference if you're living close to or below poverty. If you're, we're, if you're earning at the minimum wage, that's a lot of money. However, for most of us, water is still probably the best bang for the buck of anything you ever buy. Your drinking water service probably costs you, depending on where you live, you know, between 60 and 110 bucks a month. For that money, you get instantaneous 24-hour delivery of a life-sustaining liquid every day, all the time. Think about what you pay for your cell phone or your cable or your latte, right? This is, this is a lot cheaper. You know, the, the mayor of Newark just came out recently. They've got a, a, a lead service line problem in Newark, just like in Flint. And uh, they're estimating it's going to cost $75 million to fix it. And during the government shutdown, Newark politicians were calling on the federal government, hey, don't build the wall, build, uh, build our lead service line replacement program for Newark. It's the only way we can do it. We need federal help. I stopped and looked at it and started to think about the size of the city of Newark. Now, Newark is not a wealthy place, but if you break it down, you finance $75 million over 20 or 30 years, and you divide by the number of customers, it breaks down to a little less than $5 per customer per month. So their bills would go from something like $70 to $75. To eliminate lead service line, to eliminate lead poisoning for the children of Newark, I'm thinking that's a pretty good deal five dollars per month and we can come up with ways to help the people for whom five dollars would really hurt we can find ways to address that through rate structure through assistance programs but i think in general there's been we've been too quick to assume that the answer here is uncle sam please 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 washington bail us out when i think in a lot of ways if you put it to people i don't think any people are willing to pay for the, something that's this important and this valuable but you have to phrase it to them 75 million sounds like a big number $5 a month to save the children of Newark from lead poisoning? Sounds like a pretty good deal to me. So I think a lot of this is, is framing. You know, fr framing this as, as maybe the most valuable thing that your local government does. Aside from you know, fire, police protection maybe. And this, is, this is pretty high value stuff. Thank you. Uh, what are some public management pitfalls to avoid when pursuing a new water utility strategy in a community? And channel one of my, could you repeat the question? One sure. <laughs> some. What are some public management pitfalls to avoid when pursuing a new okay. water utility strategy in a community? Some public management pitfalls. You know, Barry mentioned it during the introduction, uh, during my introduction here that I, I work on career paths too. It's my, when I'm not doing water stuff, I do pure credit careers. I think human capital is terribly underappreciated. So what are the pitfalls? I think failing to think about human capital. Where are you going to get the workers for your water system? And how are you going to keep them? Water utility work has changed a lot. If you talk to the real old timers in the water utility industry, you could get a job in a water utility as an operator, you know, system operator or a treatment plant operator with a high school diploma and a strong back. You could get a job. Uh, in a water utility and get a pretty solid middle class union scale salary for the rest of your life. This is no longer unskilled or semi-skilled work. The Safe Drinking Water Act requirements now require people to have a pretty high level of math skill, some degree of chemistry and biology training, and certainly a high degree of literacy. A lot of systems are struggling with, uh, uh, with staffing for their utilities because they're thinking about the price of the pipe and the price of the treatment plant and the price of the reservoir, and they're not thinking of the price of the person who runs it. Water systems are highly technically complex systems now, and they're highly automated. You and I, or anybody in here who doesn't have, have background in water treatment, could, be, could get a week's training and go in and operate the water plant. It's so highly automated. Like, your job is to like, turn on the computer and sit back and not break anything. And that works fine until anything goes wrong. 
And then as soon as anything goes wrong, you need a high degree of technical expertise in order to save your population from getting sick and dying. Those people are not cheap and the number of them is shrinking. So I'd say the biggest pitfall is failing to remember that you need human capital. You gotta get highly qualified people, you have gotta find ways to train them, retain them. And that can be politically difficult sometimes in public management. I'm gonna finish up this, the answer with one quick anecdote. I was talking to a, a utility CEO recently. Guy manages a, she manages a large utility and she was making a pitch to her city council for investment in an employee development program. I want, I want mid-career training to get our, our staff up to speed with the latest technology. And uh, her, 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 I think it was her city councilor, her mayor says, well, it was the mayor. The mayor says to her, well, what if we invest all, these, all this money in our staff and then they go and leave? And she says, well, what if we don't invest in our staff and they stay? This is a question people forget to ask. You know, having a, a, an unqualified employee is not a great asset to your organization. Right? So get, you know, investing adequately in human capital, I think, is, is a common, common missed opportunity. Thank you. So these are going to be our last uh, two questions. We're okay. almost ready to wrap up. Um, but this one is about uh, aging infrastructure in other sectors outside of water as well. So the problem of aging infrastructure can be seen many places in this country. Um, and whether the infrastructure is owned privately or publicly, it really requires an enormous budget to improve infra infrastructure. Um, and this is a, a student from Barry, uh, Dr. Rabe's current class who's wondering whether there is a fundamental and sustainable solution to this problem across sectors, not just in the water sector? A solution, probably not. Uh, many solutions, maybe. Yeah. Uh, look, I'm, I'm not a real ideological guy. I think that there's a huge role for the private sector in infrastructure investment uh, that's, that's underexploited. Uh, I think that can be a part of the answer. I could be surprised, politics surprises me sometimes. I don't expect the federal government to pass a trillion dollar infrastructure bill, but it could happen. I didn't expect the outcome of the 2016 presidential election. Uh, so surprises happen. Look, uh, one of the things I think about with infrastructure in, um, I, think, I think just simply a, a growing political awareness of it is the long-term sustainable thing. And I'm encouraged because we have politicians paying attention to this issue now. 2009, we had a $900 billion stimulus bill. It's a staggering amount of money. Less than, I think less than 70 million of that went, 70 billion rather, went into water and sewer infrastructure. The overwhelming majority of it did, that went to infrastructure at all went to the energy sector. But a lot of that just didn't go to uh, didn't go to infrastructure at all, and I think it's because folks weren't thinking about infrastructure generally, and they certainly weren't thinking about about water uh, infrastructure. So, it, to the extent that there's a, a long-term solution, it's probably more a political than a policy question. It's, it's having a political support for infrastructure much more than it is uh, any one policy uh, policy alternative. Thank you, and this will be our yeah. last question. How likely are we to see another crisis like Flint, and what can be done to prevent this, particularly as it relates to water system finance? Yeah, uh, we don't have to wait. The crises are happening. They're happening every day, all the time. One of the things that's, that's wild for those of us who have been in the water sector a long time, Flint wasn't the first, wasn't the biggest, wasn't the worst, wasn't the most racially discriminatory, it was just the one that caused, that just caught the American imagination. I have no idea why. It's like, why does one silly YouTube video go viral and another one that's just as silly doesn't? Like the ice bucket challenge, what was that, <laughs> right? Why Flint? You know, people don't know, maybe if you've studied environmental history, you know this, that when the Cuyahoga River caught fire in 1967, 69, 69, 1969, it was the fifth time the Cuyahoga River had caught fire. Why was it the, why did fires one through four not cause the Clean Water Act? I don't know. Some of it may have to do with Ed Muskie being in Congress and wanting to run for president. Maybe that was all it was. Why did the Flint water crisis catch the public imagination? I don't know, but those crises are happening all the time. I mentioned Newark, Corpus Christi, Texas, predominantly Hispanic city in, the, in South Texas 
had a, 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 a drinking water contamination problem far worse than Flint, happening about the same time as the New York Times was reporting on Flint. I was expecting the national media to descend on Corpus Christi, not a peep outside of South Texas. So those crises are happening. What can we do to prevent them? Change the structural incentives in place for politicians who govern water. Give them incentives to claim credit. Give them reasons to pursue policy. But flints are happening everywhere, all the time, every day. It's, uh, it's an unseen and, uh, or unacknowledged, uh, unfolding, ongoing crisis. And, and one that, that the industry is grappling with, the water sector is grappling with, but it's not an isolated event. It's just the one people noticed. Okay. Thank you. My pleasure. I think we could profitably continue this discussion long into the afternoon, but we are indeed at time. Thank you all so much. would ask you again to please be sure to complete your assessment form and leave that with us. But before leaving, and then perhaps many of you returning out into a very cold environment, and please stay safe, <laughs> please join me in thanking me at Manny Teodora for joining us. Thank you. Thanks very much.